We're here to talk about Transformers with composer Steve Jablonski. I'm Kaya Savas. I run filmmusicmedia.com. Yeah. You might have heard of it. If you didn't, go check it out. We have some cool stuff there. I want to thank Creature Features and Taylor White for hosting this amazing event. And uh, yeah, give them a round of applause. And uh, let's get things underway. We can welcome composer Steve Jablonski. Steve, how are you doing? I'm all right. <laughs> I survived the 101. And yeah, I came all the way up here. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about Transformers today. A uh, little known fact, Steve, sta Steve started scoring Transformers when he was 15. And then <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, it's been 10 years. It's 2007 was the first one. Does it feel like 10 years of Transformers in your life? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were there was you know, enough space in between that I could recover and do other things. So right. each one was you know, felt so a little new. So let's talk about let's go to the, let's rewind to the first film and uh, talk about when that project started coming together and when Michael Bake approached you for it. I know it was a big thing because it was kind of his uh, you know he started he branched away from Jerry Bruckheimer. He was doing working with DreamWorks and Spielberg was involved. So talk about kind of building those those first conversations you had about what the music was going to be for the first Transformers. He's not a man of many words, and I think kind of the only direction I got was this has to have some kick-ass themes, and uh, <laughs> one, one threat he threw at me, one, I don't know if it was a threat, but he said, Stephen's going to be listening to these themes uh, next week, so, and I knew which Stephen he meant. <laughs> it's only the one Stephen, really, so that put a little pressure on me, but what he was showing me was so inspiring, you know, it, it just looked so amazing. I still remember looking at the first renderings of Optimus and going, you know, that looks so real. How did, cause we'd never really seen anything like that. Now it's like, oh, whatever, we've seen that right. so many times. But back then, it wasn't that long ago, it was really Groundbreaking. revolutionary. Yeah, I, mean, that was, I, mean, was. I remember reading things where the, the ILM computers were burning down in the middle of the night from rendering. Yeah. And that's Michael's proud of that, I'm sure. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, he doesn't get too specific with music. He just, He'll, he'll usually say, here's a scene that I've cut together or, or something he's proud of or thinks it's representative of the film or whatever, and he'll show it to me and say, go work on that. <laughs> so when you start, I know you, your, your method is you, you create, you kind of create these suites beforehand to kind of build themes and everything. And I think the, the biggest thing of, for Transformer success were the themes, and I think those lived on to today. I mean, you hear them and events, you know, fireworks and stadiums for football, I mean, everything. Um, so when you were creating these big heroic themes, I mean, how did you kind of boil down the themes for the, for the Autobots and then the Decepticon themes, which have a pretty cool chant, and I think there's some cool things behind that one, too. Yeah. Well, with any film, I just start writing ideas and end up with a ton of tracks, and some of them stick and some of them don't. And that, in the first Transformers, most of them stuck. Michael liked a lot of them. The one that I wrote as the Autobots theme was, I didn't write it with the intention of it being the Autobots theme. It was just an idea I had, a melodic idea, and I fleshed it out, and and uh, he kind of threw it around the film, and it just felt right for the for those guys. Um, I mean, of course, I kind of <laughs> thought this would be heroic, and our heroes right. are <laughs> Autobots, so. The Decepticons thing, that just kind of came out of nowhere. I was messing around with that rhythmic uh, riff, that chant idea, just right. on a choir sample, and it just expanded out of that. And but didn't you say you kind of took yeah. the words? The yeah. <laughs> um, then we had to decide what should they say because yeah. I had just used like ah ah ah, and it sounded <laughs> stupid. But I knew I wasn't going to do that in the final. Right. So I, I came up with the genius idea of taking <laughs> since these are the Decepticons. I wrote down all of their names um, uh, by syllable and just kind of flipped them around and jumbled them up into uh, wor other words, <laughs> new words, and we had to delete a few that sounded slightly obscene <laughs> and, uh, uh, and a few that sounded like, I don't know, we, I, when we were recording occasionally we'd go, did they just say, uh, what did they say, uh, Mercedes? Or, <laughs> so we'd have to 
take some of those out. But, but yeah, it was, that's where that language came from. Cool. So as the series kind of progressed, like things got more complex, and you have to try to outdo the last one as things. The second one kind of threw a big challenge at you guys because it was the writer's strike film. And when you're working with kind of no script structure, how did that affect your process? I know that Michael was probably trying to scramble together something, and when it came down to the score, I know that was a pretty hectic thing, so how did it, you not collapse under all that pressure? <laughs> I don't know. I think I did a couple times. <laughs> you, yeah, that one was kind of a mess, because they started shooting before the script was finished, so we, we didn't really know how it was going to end, and that makes it a little tricky, but I sort of knew the themes. I mean, if, if people who've seen them all know that they kind of fall into a similar pattern <laughs> of, as far as the chunks of story and right. what happens and so I kind of knew and Michael you know I have the script obviously I would read that and I just started writing themes like I always do and, and one thing that Michael has said to me since the second film was I don't I don't want any of those old themes so if anybody here is wondering why we don't reuse them that much that's why he's he wants. He wanted every f new f every film to be sort of a new thing. Right. And I always wondered if subconsciously he kind of knew they were all sort of the same, and <laughs> he wants the music to make them different, which is fine with me. It made it more interesting for me. But a lot of fans were like, "Why, why didn't you? You have all these themes from the first one. Where they all go? That's where they went." <laughs> and, but I would squeeze them in when I could, and by uh, inevitably at the end of each film, he would say to me we should use some of those old themes. <laughs> and he would, you know, and this is after months of him going, I don't want any of that stuff. That's the old <laughs> fashioned stuff we don't sell. It's old old whatever. <laughs> He's a unique dude. Did I, what was your question? Did I answer yeah, it? Yeah, I think that was about the second film. Oh, okay. um, and throughout the course of the movies, you got to work with some other additional artists as well, like Limp Bizkit and, um, I'm not Limp Bizkit. Oh. I missed that one. No. Imagine Lincoln Dragons Park. and oh, Lincoln yeah, Park, Park, sorry. Misspoke. Yeah, Lincoln Park and um, Imagine Dragons. So yeah. when you work with these other kind of big group names, how do you incorporate your sound with them to, because they write on a few tracks, and mm -hmm. how was that collaboration with them? It was cool. They come in. I, I worked more closely, I think, with Imagine Dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I went to, they came to my studio, I went to their studio, but uh, Lincoln Park came to my place as well. And it was their, uh, I forget the song name, but it, uh, they did a few, obviously, right, but there, yeah. there was one, oh, they all blur, <laughs> that had a really cool piano uh, kind of riff. They all have big cool piano riffs, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but they gave me the multi-track, and uh, I would just work it into the score and, and uh, do orchestral versions of it. Uh, so we, they only came over once and did mm -hmm. recorded some sort of wild tracks for me. Just use it for like the nest theme. The, uh -huh. Yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. But so. Imagine Dragons, and that was the same sort of thing. Although I had uh, the singer, Dan, sing on a couple things. Yeah, there's really those cool. vocals mm -hmm. in, your, in the score, which, you know, yeah, yeah. the lyrics in the score. Yeah, that, we went to Vegas for the, to their studio and just recorded a bunch of stuff with them and brought it back and cut it all up and put it in the movie. <laughs> and thank God they were, there were a couple spots where I pitched it to be in the key of my queue and I was worried that they would be mad and, uh, <laughs> and they, they at the premiere they're like hey we, that was cool that you pitched that and you sped it up I'm like okay, okay I guess, uh, do you really think that or are you pissed I don't know <laughs> there's, a one key, only, there's one scene where it was a little bit higher pitched maybe than because I sped it up a little bit and I was a little worried but Michael liked it so <laughs> actually no, that's a good story I in my demo that I made, it was it, the vocal sounded a little funky because I was just did it quickly. You know, I did the processing quickly. I sped it up and pitched it and everything to, so it would fit with the intention of always going back and redoing it better. You know, you can do a better version of it with other software. It just takes longer. It's boring, but so, so Michael was living with the demo version forever, and the final dub came along where we mixed the whole film, and I replaced it with the new vocal. You know, the new shiny processed <laughs> sounding much better vocal and Michael is like, What the fuck happened to the vocals? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I'm like, Oh, you mean it's better? <laughs> no. <laughs> so back in goes the demo vocal. That's you, I try, you know. Yeah. And that, there's fifty examples of that sort of thing. Michael gets very used to things. Right. 
like he's got an ear, serious ear, as far as uh, you know, listening and specific little things, nuances. He wasn't having that <laughs> new vocal, even though it was better. And, but, uh, All right. So now we're at the the fifth. I mean, we're at the last night just came out. That's the fifth Transformers film. How did this one differ than all four that came before it? I mean, how did you approach this one as something new, even though it's mm -hmm. you know, the fifth in the franchise that well, you got to compose, which is very rare these days. I mean, how often do you see a composer scoring five <laughs> of the same film in the same franchise? I mean, not even That's Marvel crazy. and DC. You know, it's like it's a pretty big thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the <laughs> producer, the main producer, gave me a jacket that says. Uh, for five something I don't even remember I should have brought it to show you right there were like I think 31 of us that had worked on all five movies and we got wow. a jacket for it but, but uh, when Michael told me about the the whole King Arthur thing I thought oh that's cool that got me immediately excited and I started writing just based on that I thought oh, it would give me a chance to try something slightly different right and they showed me that whole opening sequence that was the first thing I saw and I said oh is that how much of that sort of thing is in the movie? And they're like, well, there's like one flashback. and <laughs> <laughs> So I had pictured all of this really cool Transformers action on the, you know, these Scottish planes where they filmed. But, so, but whatever. I, I uh, wrote those themes just inspired by this whole idea that the Transformers are connected to. Right. But you got to carry the theme King throughout. Arthur. Yeah, you got to carry it yeah, throughout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tied to, I uh, forget her name, but her character. She was a descendant. Mm -hmm. of yeah, the descendant side. of Merlin. No, I, I liked that idea. I just think that they should have picked one storyline, in my opinion, and, right. and stuck with it. Right. And, and there was, it could have been good, a good film. That's what we were all very frustrated. As a composer, it's frustrating to track the stories when right. he's doing a lot of this, taking these scenes and... So how do you? I mean, yeah. How do you keep up with that when you you write a piece of music? And I know this one. I know Michael likes to edit down to the wire. And I think certain of the films, each premiere had a different cut. Yeah, I read, I right. saw that. And like with this one, I mean, when you have a certain flow going and he moves something here and there, I mean, that ruins everything for you, right? I mean, how do you? Yeah, pretty much. How do you? How do you um, <laughs> well, it depends how much time you have. Right. If you have enough time to redo it, uh, but he gets so crazy at the end because that's when all these visual effects are coming in. Right. And I just, I don't know why they don't do that stuff sooner. There's, I'm sure it comes down to money, but yeah. a lot of the visual effects I didn't see until, am I too loud? Is that okay? Uh, I didn't see until the premiere. Like wow. I didn't see the finished thing. Um, and I, a lot of them I really just didn't see until the very end. Mm -hmm. So you can only do and when and he hasn't seen them, so he's yeah. he's like, well, we're waiting. ILM, he's cur he curses ILM a lot. <laughs> um, he does, and and so yeah, we're getting shots every day, and we'll send, and we get versions of picture three times a day. We'll get the, a cut of the movie, so our hard drives are just filling up. Wow. Yeah, we'll get three cuts of the movie a day uh, towards the end. Yeah, and you can't. There's a, like, what am I supposed to do with that? And right. you just I'll pick one and work on that one and. And sometimes they wouldn't tell me some, this big change had happened because they just forgot because they're all crazy in the cutting room and right. we just stumble. Okay, what happened over there? Why did yeah. you move that there? And that music doesn't work at all anymore. Yeah. So there's a lot of things in the film that I that make me cringe because you know but they used to flow well melodically right. and dramatically, right. but now because he I don't know he chopped the scene in half, it's just like yeah. It's, it's, how, how, how long are, are typically his like first cuts does he ever show you like is it <laughs> this one I don't even remember it was over three hours for uh -huh. sure and he wanted it he wanted to get it uh, much lower than it ended up but that's as sure you can get it he was going to I don't know if he wants me to tell people this but <laughs> yes, he had this it. idea <laughs> he said you know what I'm going to do I'm going to take out the end credits what? Okay. And he said, I'm going to, like, we can have a link. Let's say if you want to see the credits, go to. And I'm like, that's how you're going to shorten the movie? The problem is not the credits. It's all the other stuff. So that's, he just can't bring himself. And, you know, I respect that. He's the filmmaker. And right. He's, and believe, there's a whole stable of film editors telling him for months, 
like one guy had a great idea. I, he's like, just take out the whole thing of Mark and the last night and the sword. And I'm like, yeah, nobody cares. It's, <laughs> this is a Transformers movie. Oh, God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be hired again. But. <laughs> well, it's the last one. I think you're okay, right? Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was kind of my problem with it. I didn't. It's a cool story, but maybe yeah. in another movie, not in the Transformers movie. Right, That's, right. So I, but, you know. <laughs> I did the best I could. And, but the album that we have here, though, this is a, your presentation. I mean, you really made sure that yes. this is the presentation. Oh, yeah. So. These are all... Uh, need water? <laughs> I have some. I, not, I think we have some. Um, uh, yeah. That, another reason I like to write sweets, we call them, is for that reason. Right. Um, those are all the things that I, well, for the most part, all the theme tracks are all the ones that I wrote just as pieces of music, not to picture. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that, th those are the ones I send to Michael and say, what do you think? Right. And he kind of slaps them around the movie and uh, then we fine tune from there. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of that, I don't think there's an edited cue on that that's CD. Awesome. <laughs> Even though in the film there is not an unedited cue. <laughs> and that's for true that's right. definitely the case there's not one cue that's not edited so let's talk about um writing for action i think that's such a complex thing where your music is competing with some of the most crazy sound effects i mean there's always sound coming from every speaker surround sound and uh how does that affect the type of instruments you pick and type of uh rhythms and stuff like that when you know you're writing to something that's like all the time like where you have to compete with that it does it's a tricky balance because you have to write something that you know Michael is going to respond to uh, which is just if it's an action cue it needs to be you know really high energy and uh, but I don't generally hear the final sound effects until the very end mm -hmm. so the way it usually works and having done all five movies I know the sound guys really well they're very cool right. guys they're really good I think they did all the Lord of the Rings too and they they get my music, so they hear what I'm doing, and they try to tailor around it as best they can. And you know, I'm conscious of it as well. If there's obviously something metallic going on, I'm not going to do a bunch of metal mm. percussion or something. But but uh, those guys are really good in that they they always get when, whenever they get a reel of film, they it's got my music in it, so they can work around it. And if they have any questions, they'll call me or. Mm. They have gone so far as to time, I told you this before, t you know, time rhythmically their sound effects to the music to help it not the, the, the helicopter blades, right? Yeah, they did that in the <laughs> third one, or they will pitch, uh, pitch shift a sound effect to be in the key, you know, if, if, and, but it's still inevitably at the dub stage, which is, it's a the dub stage, if you, for those who don't know, is a big movie, giant, giant movie theater with a mixing console in it. You guys, you're in LA, you probably all know this, but, and we just mixed the movie while watching it a thousand of times. Right. Uh, but yeah, and at that stage, that's where all the dialogue, all the music, all the sound effects go in. So there are always scenes that are like, oh my God, this is just a mess. And there's so many, so we'll take out some drums and for this section and they'll take out some gunfire at this section. And it's always comes down to fine tuning at the end. We try to do as good at prep as we can so we don't run into those things but we always do right so now that i mean after five films the, the music has become part of you know pop culture and, and and everything and you'll see it all around you'll see it at stadiums and stuff like when you when you hear your theme playing like with a fireworks <coughs> show somewhere in the mid midwest or something what like what does that evoke in you as a, as a composer who wrote that's, that yeah that's one of the coolest things for me just to like the fact that somebody felt uh, connected enough to that music that they thought, yeah, let's use that for this big thing that we're doing. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what inspires me to keep writing. And, you know, I've seen, yeah, I've seen a lot of examples of that. Although the Transformers music, Michael told me early on, did I tell you this? That he, I don't know. he didn't, he said, look, I know this is money out of your pocket, but. I don't want this music all over the place. I don't want it diluted. I don't want this. I don't want in car commercial, Chevy commercial. 
<laughs> we're getting a lot of requests, but I'm saying no. To, it's just a blanket no. Not we can't. You can't license his music for anything. Oh wow. Except sports, he said. Except sports, they have yeah, some because, loophole. Yeah, because I, I see it at football games all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. He said there's some way they can do it. But anything else? And I thought that was good. You know, that was a good call. I don't yeah. even know. Some, <laughs> some ca you, extra cash. But <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I understand where he's coming from. Because, yeah, it's more special if it's, you know, if you hear it, I think a lot of times it kind of yeah. waters it down a little bit for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite theme over the five films that, you've, that speaks to you more than any of the other ones? Oh, my God. Um, mm, I don't <laughs> Out of know. all your I babies, which one is your favorite? <laughs> well, the one that comes to mind is only, it only comes to mind because everyone, it seems to be everyone's favorite. And I'm still not even sure why. I'm glad <laughs> they like it, but the Arrival to Earth arrival thing to that Earth. everybody seems to love. Yeah. Um, so that just by default of right. fans and everything it's what people yeah, mean a lot it, yeah, for the it means a lot to me that they grasped onto it and right. I'm thinking, what did i do i gotta do that again <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i don't know i don't know what i did so kind of looking back at every uh, your entire transformers experience up to this point what's one word you would use to describe it <laughs> <laughs> oh god um <laughs> The entire thing? The entire, all five. Exhausting, maybe? <laughs> no, exhausting on one hand, but really rewarding and fulfilling. I know right. that's three words, but because it has, you know, I get messages from like this, this teenage girl, and I don't know where she's, somewhere in Europe, keeps saying how the, the so I forget which theme she latched onto from the new one, but mm -hmm. how it's, it made her feel better that day, and she was having a really terrible day. Or I don't. She didn't elaborate why, but she said it just made her feel like she'll be. Everything will be okay. And right. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tear up here. No, something in my eye. And that's you know I've gotten so many of those. And the, the Transformers say what you will about the films. They do reach a lot of people right. all over the place, and I have them to thank. For you know, introducing all these people all over the world to me and my music, and yeah. you know, I can do all the last witch hunters I want, <laughs> and nobody will have a clue who, who I am. But the Transformers is such a big thing. That right. Yes. <laughs> it means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, that, I took that. That's maybe why the first one was so scary because I knew how important this franchise was right. to my my own brother. I saw him grow up with these toys. I was just slightly too old to be yeah. playing, but I saw what he was how excited he was for this stuff and so uh yeah it's well, meant I mean, a lot. It, and, and i think that that girl in europe it means a lot to everyone i, I can relate to that as well and i'm sure everyone Thanks. else here can and and so thank you for bringing that music to us oh, and please, let's uh anytime. i know you guys might have some questions so let's open it up for some questions from the audience yes let's go to the front right here hey hey, hey so just a question for you yes. it's, it's interesting how i, I was at a you know about that documentary that just came out, Score? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, oh, you, yes. were, you, were, you were at the Q&A uh, on Friday at the Sherman Oaks. Yeah, yeah. I think about getting everybody else to see the Tyler the next night. Oh, yeah. Beats. Tyler, nice. yeah. And he's done a few you know, video game scores. Mm -hmm. and I know you contributed to the Gears of War franchise mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, a lot of us, I work in the video game industry as an editor. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just very curious. Do you have, probably not preference, but do you have any ambition or have you been approached recently to doing more games? Or do you? That you're interested in? Yeah, no, I I was approached. I've been approached a few times. Uh, it just never worked out schedule-wise. There was one. I probably shouldn't say this because it's they're really like hardcore about it. There's a big game that's coming out in the next few years that I was approached to do, and mm. I just couldn't do it because of my schedule. Because they, as you know, they have milestones yeah. that you have to reach, and it's it's not like you work on it for a few months and you're done. You work on it a month here, a month here, a month here, yeah. over the course and I couldn't figure out a way to make it work but but I'd love to I love games I play games more than I <laughs> should admit process, being a uh, it's different actually because of the, the just the technical approach yeah. where you write I'll get sheets that say we need a 90 seconds of moderate tempo action music or you know a minute and then of ambient spooky music and there's like a hundred of those yeah and it has to it always has to loop 
back to the beginning seamlessly so it can play forever. Right. <laughs> so it's just it's a different process. The cinematics, the, the little things in, in the middle of the game are more like what I'm used to because they're like little scenes. But the gameplay stuff, it's, it's fun. I like it. It's not because I'm not worrying about picture. I'm just writing right. stuff. Anybody else? I guess on the back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of a pain in the butt. That uh, <laughs> this whole thing. There's a. I'll just quickly explain. That one went away because there's a union rule, a musicians' union rule in L.A. Well, any musicians' union, but that's where I recorded all of the Transformers. So they all are affected by this rule that if they sell 15,000 units, the musicians get a bonus. All of the musicians get a bonus so that they're kind of partaking in the success of the film and the soundtrack. But the studio didn't want to pay it. So instead of paying it, as soon as it hit 14999 they yank it. And wow. Yeah. And I didn't even know. That's... That was a terrible time when I learned about all this stuff because yeah. people started messaging me on whatever uh, Facebook or stuff saying, "What? Where did the soundtrack go?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's in iTunes. Just go, <laughs> just click on iTunes and type it in." And they're like, "No, it's not." So I, I looked. I went to iTunes. I go, "Where did it go? It must be a mistake." And I started looking into it, and you can't get answers from a studio on this sort of thing for. Right. It took it forever, I but was I. Curious, so I oh God. I'm. I am actively looking for a way to do something to get that music. Even it came down to me going, "What if can I put it on my own website for free so just people can listen to it?" Right. But they would They'll track kill me. you down. They would kill. Me. Oh yeah, <laughs> they would kill me. But um, that's what it comes to. And now we're at a point where so few people buy CDs anyway. Right. Or even buy albums on iTunes almost. It's like they'll buy the track that they want and then they'll go listen to the rest on Spotify. Mm -hmm. So it's really getting hard to convince anyone to make soundtracks, right. CDs especially. It's La La Land and the guys are like, you know, they're saviors for this sort of thing. Yeah, applause um, for La La Land Records, come on. I w <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I wish, uh, I, the, the third one that was sort of in the in the foggy area where I didn't really know this was all happening. So that's why that one kind of got screwed big time. And the fourth one, I really tried to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, but, you know, it sold 15,000 and now it's gone from iTunes. Right. But the EP is still there and I'll explain why quickly. The EP is still there because that's all samples. Right. That was the way around it. I said, how about we just release a few tracks? It's, but it was just too difficult to redo the whole score or to remix and re-release the whole score with just samples. And plus, yeah. I don't know, with fans wouldn't even want that. But yeah, but yeah all, that, all the EP for the fourth one is samples. All right, any more questions yeah. in the back there? Um, a follow-up yes. question. Hey. Does the 15,000 number count with regards to packaging media also, or is it just digital sales? All, both. both. And then a question of my own about something completely different. It's more music. To, it's more specific to music writing and arrangement. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you do non-verbal choral writing? Obviously, in something like Decepticon or Jimmy Autobots, mm -hmm. they're just singing the melody, so that's pretty straightforward. But then, in something like Decepticons, right. you can hear consonants. You can hear syllables being pronounced by the choir. So, is that nonsensical and to the extent that it's it's not words and it's not melodic it's not just voices following the melodic line of the orchestra how did he come up with that uh, he must did he, did he show up late <laughs> no, no, no. well we did talk about briefly how he no, I, I can answer that. it again well that that one specifically yes, I, just, I apologize oh no no it's okay <laughs> no please i was only kidding i did uh he asked me that question but for that one specifically i took the choir will sing what you give them, so you always have to come up with some sort of lyrics for them to, they would make it up on the spot, if, but that would just be too time consuming and you're on the clock when you're recording all these musicians, so I always give them lyrics. That one, I took the names of all the Decepticons, broke them up by syllable, 
jumbled them up into new words just as a fun thing. That was kind of all it was, and we had fun with it. And that that's and we specifically laid out the lyrics in a way that sounded sort of okay. So that's a made-up language that that uh, we came up with based on the Decepticon, Decepticon names. names. <laughs> and that's, I think, the most sort of specific thing I've done with choir lyrics. A lot of times it'll we'll just use a u e or whatever, and mm -hmm. rarely do I give the words because I it, I don't well, want it Hans to sound is, too. Hans uses the a u e. Hans and I uses those. Yeah, kind of he chords. does. Um, I think I have that sample. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's just the vowels. Yeah, spoken. E I O E. Yeah. Uh, if if the choir is singing, I, it always I don't want it to sound cheesy. This is the problem. I don't. I'd rather it be non not understandable. Or in something like Keanu, that Key and Peele movie, where it's just right. supposed to be so ridiculous and over the top. I think we did give them some. Oh no, we gave them Latin. I wrote lyrics, or I don't know if anybody even knows what that movie is, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's about a cat. <laughs> and Key and Peele. Uh, I wrote, oh, I wish I, I should have brought them. It's probably my phone somewhere. Uh, something about you are the most beautiful cat in the world, and <laughs> a bunch of stupid things like that. And I had a Latin translator translate them into Latin, and that was what the choir was singing. <laughs> so. Is that more difficult? Because I know, like, John Williams did something in Swahili, Purana style, for the poor, which is what the mm -hmm. poor just saying. Is it, is it, did you think about doing something like that with this, or? For what, Transformers? Yes. Uh, it, it all depends on the project. You know, that, that, for the first Transformers, I had that idea, say, let's use the Decepticon names, but, I mean, we could have just used them straight up, but that would have sounded stupid <laughs> Megatron. <laughs> <My God. Yeah. laughs> so we jumbled them up and the, the uh, Keanu thing I just thought hey, what if we did Latin talking singing about how this cat is so amazing and <laughs> so it just ideas come up and a lot of the other scores um, like the island that my name is Lincoln track they're not really singing anything we just came up with a nice melodic sounding uh, Lyrics, I guess you call them. They are lyrics. They're singing something, but it's th that that particular one doesn't mean anything. It's I try to put. I want it to sound good without, you know, sounding kind of. I, I like the fact that a lot of fans have said, "What are they saying?" I don't yeah. Know. I kind of like that they don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can't translate it to this cat is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thanks. And sorry for asking something. Oh, no, 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 please. I was question. only kidding. I felt bad right as soon as I uh, made fun. Of. Did you want to become a composer when you were young, and what got you into uh, becoming a composer? I did not really think about it when I was young. I did have the John Williams, the Star Wars album, and my mom has a picture of me with headphones on conducting when I was like seven or eight or something. That was pretty fun. But uh, I was always into film music and films all my life, I, and then I... Uh, uh, junior high, elementary school, I started playing clarinet. So I had music more of as, as a hobby. <clears throat> and I went to college for, with an intention of getting a degree in computer science, so no music at all. Uh, but about a year in, I thought, oh, this is not, uh, not for me. I just wasn't into it at all. So I switched to a music major. Because again, I, it w I kept it as a hobby for that long. I, I had keyboards and stuff at home. I'd mess around with my own compositions, but I never intended to do this for a living. Um, and when I switched to music major, I thought, oh, maybe I'll work as a recording engineer or something like that, somewhere in the studios or doing something. I don't know. I didn't know what I was going to do. I did for a while some backing tracks for these uh, karaoke uh, <laughs> places where you could go and record yourself singing Little Mermaid songs and <laughs> so I would and that was a good learning experience right. actually I had to pick apart and orchestrate and recreate you know, these Alan Menken things on my little synthesizers and but yeah when I started looking for a job in the studios I was calling around at various studios and I saw hmm, Hans Zimmer Media Ventures what is this place and <laughs> I knew Hans Zimmer for obviously for years I was a fan so I called and uh, started as an intern there. 
you're hired. It doesn't work that way this morning. <laughs> Can I come help, Hans? You're hired. <laughs> uh, that's kind of almost how it worked. Yeah. I said, do you need any help? And the guy's like, yeah, come on down. <laughs> but that was before he was the mega lord of all <laughs> Hollywood. Touring was, the world right now. He, it, was a, it was a lot smaller operation than he is, is now. He was still obviously a big star, but right. so it was a smaller studio facility. So I got to see a lot and just kind of never left for months. And worked with Harry. And yeah, I worked with Harry. And, and even then, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself. But uh, I, I would use Harry Gregson Williams' studio when he wasn't there, messing around with just writing little cues to whatever right. film he was working on. And that led to me actually writing cues for the films he was working on. And Hans getting wind of it and going, oh, yeah, I can't, you, when you're done with him, can you come over to my room and uh, finish this cue and this and that? And it just sort of snowballed into whatever. To five Transformers films. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. And thank you, Steve, for, sure. for showing up and, and talking about your work. Um, and yeah, we, we, we did a nice, big, long interview for like an hour and a half. So if you want to hear more of Steve's life, you can go to filmmusicmedia.com and, and watch Steve and I ramble more. <laughs> no, me ramble. You ramble. <laughs> me enjoying it and everyone else enjoying it. So let's, uh, yeah, I guess we'll line up on the outside and we can get uh, the signing underway. Great, thanks everybody. Sure. I saw some other hands, so you just ask me <laughs> if you got something you wanted to ask. Them.